Well, I just wanna welcome everybody to this latest edition in the uh, Ask Me Anything series brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. And I'm your host today. My name is Patty Vargas, and we will be together for uh, just under an hour. And if you've joined with video, you'll be able to see our guests and our attendees alike. Um, questions and comments are always welcome. This is intended to be more of a dialogue than an interview. But if there is something that you'd like to contribute anonymously, just put it in the chat to me and I'd be happy to share it for you. So today we have a subject matter expert in the hot seat uh, with the topic, setting emotional boundaries, how to cultivate a happier work-life balance. And my subject matter smarty pants today is Contessa Canaday. And she is the founder of Contessaology, where they provide high performance coaching for women and help them redefine what career satisfaction actually means to them. Maybe, maybe the best way to put it is defining what satisfaction looks like on their own terms. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Contessa and tell us more about you. Tell us how you got into this. What was your, your leading to go into this? Just tell us a little bit more about you. Yeah, so my name is Contessa. Nice to meet you if I haven't met you already. Um, I got into Contessology just through a lifetime process and a process of being connected with women, no pun intended, just having women all around me and going through these different conversations and finding out that there's a lot of similarities to what women are going through us in terms of their work and careers. And so I made it a, a passion of mine to just research and find out as much as information as possible to find out why women have such a harder time being happy, you know, in their lives, but especially at work. And we know that work directly connects to how happy you are at home. And nowadays work and home are almost the same place. So I'm glad to be here for today. I think today is a great, se uh, great session to talk about work-life boundaries. I know we've heard that word many times, but just looking at it through the lens of creating boundaries, thinking of boundaries in general in the workplace that will lead over to home, of course. That's nice. And I kind of like the way that you say work-life boundaries instead of, you know, we've heard like, 45 gabillion presentations, you know, and speakers talk about work-life balance. And, you know, I, I sort of came to the conclusion that there is no such thing as work-life balance. And it is up to us to set what those boundaries are. Um, so I, I like that you choose that word instead. So what, what was the, your thinking behind that? Well, I, in my work, I work with women in their careers, but to be honest, it's working with women in their lives. And I just have a focus of back to, to career. So when I say work-life boundaries, I'm basically saying that we as women need to create boundary, boundaries at work, at home, and with ourselves. We are the first persons to cross our own boundaries. And so that's something that I want to highlight, you know, it's saying work-life boundaries. Mm -hmm. Good, excellent. Why do we do that? Why, why do we break our own, our own boundaries? It's because we want to do it all. We want to be successful. There's not a lot of movies like Bad Moms or more like Good Mom movies where the woman can do everything in this 21st century economy. We are, I mean, you may have children, a family. If you don't have children, you may have family that relies on you to, for communication and getting things done with parents. And so we have so many hats that we wear every single day. And it's hard for us to just, you know, let go, delegate, or even just create boundaries. And so boundaries are at, you know, the forefront of this conversation. But of course, I hope we can eventually start talking about like self-care and things like that. Just a lot of words that we hear, but we don't really dive into and discuss. And it can also mean different things to different women. But I think a lot of us have similarities in, in the idea that we aren't relegated to stay at home if we do not choose to stay at home. We can do so many different things, but then when we choose to do these different roles, everyone's given us more and more to do, which is, makes us feel amazing because we want to help. And we're brought up as young girls to people please, be the good girl, to not make a fuss. What, in school, if you did well, what happened? The teacher just left you alone and said you were a good girl. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of hard to 
let go of emotions. And so when you set boundaries, it's about taking the emotion out of it. Oh, okay. That's a good point. Taking the emotion out of it and, and setting those boundaries before you're at burnout stage, you know, before you're feeling super resentful of everybody and everything around you, you know, then you can just say, here's, here's the sane way to, to go about life. Yeah. It's funny. You said um, the word resentment, there's three key indi indicators of if a boundary is being crossed, it's anger, resentment, and it's also, can you guys guess the last one? Guilt. Guilt. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Guilty. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are grown in created in everyone's different, but just something similar that I find with a lot of women that I work with is that guilt is a driving force. And even young children know how to guilt mom or teachers in school or employees. And when we are made to be people pleasers, it's hard to say the word no. And when you create boundaries, it's all about saying the word no. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of us hear that, but we don't really know the method or the tools or how to recover when mm -hmm. our boundaries are being crossed. Yeah, great. Great. Well, those of you that have joined us here online, I want to hear from you too. Like, what are your thoughts um, about this? I know that uh, for myself, when I was still working in corporate, one of my New Year's resolutions would inevitably be to work less, you know, to, to create some boundaries that I didn't allow, um, that I didn't allow the workplace to cross into. And it truly was a, um, something that I had to finally say, this isn't going to happen if, if I don't do it, because people will take as much from you as you allow them to take, you know, you get the behavior that you tolerate. So if I didn't set some of those ground rules for myself and then hold myself accountable to doing it, then sure, I could work you know, a 60 hour work week in the office and a 60 hour work week at home. And somehow I had convinced myself that I was superwoman and that was perfectly okay. <laughs> yeah, How about the rest of you, do you all, have you all had a similar experience that led you to, um, to the brink like it did with me? <laughs> Deborah's well, nodding her head. head nods. Mm -hmm. when, when you said that you made a new year's resolution, you were making an assessment of your values. Values, And when you want to start setting boundaries, you think about what values mean to you and what's important to you. And you really need to sit down and do like a, a boundary audit and value audit. What is, what's important to you? It's important for you to um, have time during the year to go on vacation. That's important. You need to let your, you know, people at your job know that this is going to happen. And it's really hard to let go of that because then a lot of other things come into play, delegation and letting things go. Also, when you're looking at your values, you wanna make sure that you understand them because you could say that you want more free time, but what you really want is disconnected time, time to from six to nine, very specific, that you won't turn your phone off. Mm -hmm. Or if you're wanting to think of different boundaries that you can set, you can set boundaries that focus on communication with other people. So there's the, um, if you're an entrepreneur, you might not have a boss, but you have clients that you may feel obligated to be available 24 seven. And people actually respect you more when you set boundaries. You can say when you are going to be available, I'm available from eight to four and four to 6.30 each day. And people actually respect you more for that as a businesswoman or a professional when you're being, being very specific. If you have no boundaries, which many of us, I know I definitely had a problem with that and still struggle with today, then people are going to have less respect for you because they can take whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And so once we shift that mindset from people pleasing to making people feel bad, you are going to get pushed back. You're going to get hurt feelings and negativity, but they're going to have more respect for you. So even as an entrepreneur, you deserve to have what is valuable to you if those hours are what it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is this, are we able to interject 
I'm not, yes, yeah, this is, yeah. this is my first time of, of doing one of these. So I'm just absorbing what you're saying. So, you know, it's interesting Contessa. I've been like, yeah, I was nodding my head deeply because um, I hit my wall um, significantly uh, March of 2018. And I exited from something that I allowed. I didn't realize that I was allowing myself to give so much of myself away. It's a long, it's a long story. So I'll, I'll kind of move it forward to my point here. So, um, you know, I stepped up and, and um, exited from something that I had been um, hiding behind. Yeah. Actually, this is something I teach. I was hiding behind being visible. That sounds interesting, right? I was actually being highly visible, but I was hiding because I was letting myself get lost in, in being um, so busy for somebody else. And so what's been interesting is um, in setting my boundaries and teaching my clients how to set boundaries and hold them, actually honoring that's, you know, for those of us that have worked through this, what I found for myself is that unknowingly I was um, living with, or I was showing up with codependent behaviors that came from my past. And I didn't, I thought I cleared that with something else. I didn't realize it was showing up in that way. And so why my, my point of this is that um, what, what you just said, Contessa, in setting those boundaries and holding them in business that more people will respect you. I've also found that it's a great way, um, I call it building your sandbox, building your sandbox that you wanna play in, right? And making sure that it's, it's your sandbox. Um, but I've found that in holding that, it is a great buffer for people who are no longer a good fit for you for being your client, because those people will show up and they're going to say things like, um, well, I can't get a hold of you. You're too busy, right? Because guess what? They've got a codependent behavior going on and no longer are, do you know, when you set that boundary and you respect it you're not being codependent. So, you know, there's a lot in what you're saying, which I very much appreciate your perspective because um, it's resonating and just reinforcing that, you know, it's worth it. <laughs> and you said a key word, I wasn't gonna bring this up, but codependency is one of the leading causes of mental, not disorder, but stress in people's lives that is unresearched. Totally. Code Codependency is just a phenomenon that has happened for hundreds of years that no one has really studied or talked about. And when you hear the word codependency, you think that you're dependent upon someone else. No, no, no. It goes both ways. ways. You can be mm -hmm. codependent and you can be the person who's giving. And mm -hmm. so you need that relationship to just go forward. And many people fall into that category. And mm -hmm. a great way to get out of codependent behavior is to, like we talked about at the beginning, go back onto, uh, upon what your value system is. What are your values? What, what's important to you? And if you are in a situation where you're helping and taking care of someone, ask why are you really doing it? Many people do it for themselves. And are you really helping anyone if you're unhappy and you're doing it for yourself? There's ways to help someone but you need to just cut that tie and let go of caring about people's decisions. You can never change someone's decision. So you need to let go of like, oh, this is my advice. Oh, you're not gonna take it. I free myself of all that guilt and resentment and anger and connectivity, and I'm gonna focus on myself. Mm -hmm. And so I love how you brought that up, but codependent behavior is something that more people should be aware of and know that it strikes at any times. A lot of parent relationships, oh. a lot of work relationships. Like you said, you had to let go of some of your clients. Boundaries are about what's important to you. You don't need anyone in your business. They need you. You are the expert. You're the specialist. You are valuable. If they don't want to participate, they will not. And they, those are people who do not like to follow boundaries because they will find you. If you have low boundaries at work, those people will gravitate towards you. They'll stand next to your desk. They're going to find you on the internet and give you a call. And so when you're working with people, first, the step is to do a boundary audit. You know, what are your values? What's important to you? And then you start to create and think about moments that you've had resentment or were angry or had guilt. After you do that, then you can identify your boundary places and start to set them. And then you need to 
not declare, but you need to communicate with people and not be afraid to communicate your boundaries because you have to do that and be specific or people aren't going to understand or they're not going to follow your boundaries. Mm -hmm. So that's like the first part of it, getting that courage. <laughs> yeah. and, well, I think it's not just courage. I think it's, I think it's skill. And um, I thought that it was a good point about they will respect your boundaries. You may lose their business, but when you have held to your boundaries, how do it, you know, recognizing that that's a success mm -hmm. and um, we can set goals, we can set boundaries, but we have to also have the skill to be able to speak up at those times and being prepared for that, being able to articulate it, recognizing that quite often what people want isn't what people need and how are we focusing on meeting needs without compromising and sometimes that's not giving people what they want instead what they need and is to work within certain hours. Mm -hmm. Lori, I'm so happy you said that because the next step is to mm -hmm. practice yep. your boundary setting, <laughs> which is so in uh, important to getting that message because when it happens, you want to be in your, your best 10, hundred percent to say that statement to that person. So you will envision when that boundary will be crossed. Let's say you're feeling overwhelmed at work. You have too much on your plate, of course, but your boss keeps giving you more. So you can practice saying to your boss, um, first tell them how you feel. If you have me do X, Y, and Z will not get done until next week. And then if you know they come back with more that week, you can say, we had this conversation and we talked about me being the most productive as possible includes me focusing on these two tasks. You asked me late Saturday night to do this task as well. What would you like me to do? And just practice that over, like just imagine where, you know where they're gonna break the boundaries, especially with work, um, I cannot be reached between seven and the next day, 7 p.m. If someone calls you, are you or texts you, are you going to reply right away? Are you going to wait till the morning? Are you going to say, "I'm so sorry, I wasn't available," and apologize? You need to, just like you said, Lori, practice internalize that so it is who you are. You were a woman, and here you roar. You know, you have to have that, and it's terrifying for for people like me. Other people are much stronger, and they don't worry about that. But it's something that you do want to practice as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's helpful to recognize there is guilt and there is false guilt. And uh, there's research out that shows women feel they will apologize for things they are not even responsible for. And, and when we do that, we diminish our power, it appears as weakness. Um, so being aware of those tendencies and breaking those and you may feel guilty, but is it guilt of something that needs to be changed or is it guilt because you are not people pleasing? And if it's not people pleasing, I'm giving what is needed, not what they want. And be learning to say, it's okay. This is a false guilt, which is a sign that I'm doing the right thing. I'm so glad you said that. I stepped away from something last Wednesday and I got to tell you, I carried that, like I carried that false guilt the way that you just expressed it okay. for about, th about three days. Yeah. And I okay. just, you know, and what was cool, what was interesting is that when I walked away from what I walked away from, I, I honestly was looking at it like, okay, whoa, is this the same pattern that was showing up that caused me to hit that wall? Wow. And it actually was. Mm -hmm. And so I did make sure that I, I acknowledged myself and, you know, I'm breaking that pattern. I'm stopping wow. that pattern. And yes, there was a reason why I got involved with what I got involved with, but it got to a point where it wasn't serving me. And that comes back to value. I think another thing to remember in all of what you're talking about is in setting those boundaries and uh, being able to express. I know that a lot of women feel a lot of discomfort or uncomfort because they equate that people pleasing to their core value. So getting into, we talk about values, 
but this is one that's so deep in there that a lot of ladies it really, um, you know, they haven't always had that space or that um, maybe that encouragement, that network to where they can truly understand what their their personal value is showing up without having to lose lose themselves in the moment. So absolutely, I love you that you said that, Deborah. A part of codependency, and I don't want to say this, but many people are codependent in some part of their life. Okay. And a big part of codependency is that when you stand up for yourself and your values, you ruminate and you ruminate. And that's that thought of it coming back over and over throughout the week. And women are more likely to ruminate than men, apparently. <laughs> and so it's actually proven scientifically. If you had a bad situation with you told a client and they said this or that you weren't available and they left and you should I have done that you know mm -hmm. it was a good, good choice but should I have done it it goes back in your mind and if you relive it while you're ruminating it your body feels it again mm -hmm. and your body doesn't know the difference we are taught with fear and anxiety um, from our primal instincts to to fear and fear at that moment. So our bodies are so evolved in our societies. We don't know that it's not real fear. We're feeling it, we're feeling it really. So if you are in a, a, a ruminating loop, which I've done many times in my career, if you start to imagine that moment in a positive light or another moment where it has been completely positive, each time you relive it, your body makes new connections and feels that moment and overrides anything. You can make yourself feel anything and your brain will follow follow suit. So I'm so happy you brought up ruminating. It's such a, a nasty beast, <laughs> but you can rewire your mind with positive lived experiences. Even thinking, oh, now I can go on that vacation and not worry about that client. Mm -hmm. Vacations in the past have been so wonderful and just say that each time it comes back. Cause it, it a lot of things that happen with, with, with women are so subtle they come in when we're not even thinking it because we're so busy we're overstressed a big part of setting boundaries is being overstressed 50 to 58 percent of americans are overstressed <laughs> and those work-life boundaries are a huge part of that you know this discussion is so interesting and, and to hear what what everybody is bringing in and contributing are just like building blocks on on top of this this whole topic and you know, remember I said that every January I would make a New Year's resolution. And literally every January I would make that same New Year's resolution. So clearly somewhere throughout the year, I was not honoring my own value system. And, and I liked what Deborah said about kind of the difference between your value system and your value, how you see yourself and your value. And um, one, one corporate uh, job that I had the longest was was incredibly uh, uh, codependent, I guess you could say even, and to the point where I, I worked so many hours and I gave so much to that company and honestly had convinced myself that if I didn't, th the world was going to end, you know, and, and so when it finally came to a point where there was such a, a clash of cultural values with my own personal values and so forth that I finally said, I got to get out of this place. It's toxic. It's not good for me. And I resigned and I left. And amazingly, that company did not fold. It was amazing. They didn't go out of business. The projects continued to go on. You know, budgets continued to be spent. And, and it was you know, here I was, Atlas, you know, trying to hold up the freaking world, and it wasn't necessary. It was self-imposed stress and um, totally violated my own sense of values, my own sense of worth, um, all, you know, all of that, so. As we said before, when you're taking care of someone else, you're not taking, I'm sure they missed you, of course, but someone else can help that business, can do that memo, mm -hmm. Who else can take care of you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is numero uno, number one. Even with parenting, feeling completely drained and giving more to your kids is not helpful. Saying to your, your children, like I have, honey, you're going to stay outside the gate of mommy's room because I need time to think by myself. Mm -hmm. And it sounds horrible, but no, everyone loves boundaries. Children love boundaries and you're, you are helping yourself first. You cannot help anyone 
if you are drained. And I, I, I know there's this little, um, these the four D's of what you can do when you're deciding, because just like with um, Lori mentioned, people will come to you with an emergency that needs to get done now, but your boundary is saying there's a red flag. They always come to you with an emergency. So is it really an emergency? You need to decide what you think is an emergency and then um, say that, but the four D's are do it or defer it or delegate it or drop it. <laughs> Those can help you do it, defer, delegate and drop it. Those are four great options to get that off of your, you know, guilt. That's like self guilt if we have guilt. Yeah. But yeah, it's, I hear that from so many women, these stories and we seem to be disappointed, but a part of the process, I know we talked about first um, doing a boundary audit and then looking for signs of resentment, anger, and uh, guilt. After that, you want to set appropriate boundaries and be specific and communicate. Then you practice those boundary setting. If someone invades your boundary or crosses it, you practice what you say when they cross it. And then at the at the very last step, at the very last step, you're going to think about if someone did cross my boundary, I was not unsuccessful. I'm going to learn from this experience and push myself up as someone who is still learning a process. You do not let that make you feel bad because you're doing great. You're identifying boundaries. Mm -hmm. What do you need to change to make sure that boundary does not get violated again? Nice. Well, and I, I think we're back to giving people what they need, not what they want. When you set a boundary for a child, they're not going to like it and they're going to verbalize that. They'll may do that. You're a bad mom. Um, I don't like you. I hate you. And knowing that that will happen, I think for particularly for moms to think about if their daughter were them in this situation, what would you want your daughter to do? And because many women want their, you want your daughters to protect boundaries, to set those. And um, we've, it, we have not grown up as women with moms who typically do set boundaries. They tried to do everything. And even in thinking, do everything because I want my daughter to do everything. Well, even well, women behind women's rights, they want the right to choose not to do everything and to do it equal. So Yeah, we should do everything that you want to do we need to rethink what success means and what everything means to us what do you want to do if you really just want to sit in bed and read a book and not work on your email that is what success is to you that's what you everything is to you you have a life where you get to do everything that means to you that so that's why it's really important to sit down and think about yourself we really don't sit down and think about what our needs are what we want and we definitely and the last part of this is self-care i know we say this all the time but self-care, there's a study done. Um, this man wanted to find out um, how people are like most successful. So he looked at tennis players and he was watching them do different matches and he was watching the expert tennis players and then the other guys. And he noticed one thing that every single expert tennis player did was they would just zone out in between some of the, the tossing, I don't know what it's called, uh, <laughs> back and forth. <laughs> oh, they would just they would just zone out and just look down, look in the air. And none of the other players who weren't as good were doing that. And he realized that your brain needs a break, time to recover. And that's how they're the most successful people in the world. They all take moments to zone out. And I'm not saying numbing. Watching TV and The Walking Dead, that's numbing. And I love numbing. But zoning out is just letting your mind be at peace and walking watching the walking dead or the bachelor is not going to give your mind peace because they're making bad choices <laughs> just as and self-care can be a part of that just walking they said just walking away from your work after every 90 minute interval will increase productivity immensely and that is walking around your house or apartment for five minutes and just you know the 10 minutes to get there and from eating something that you enjoy just thinking something happy or just being quiet. And that could be 
a, you should do self-care every day and self-care doesn't have to be a massage. I know we want that. I really want that now during COVID, but it doesn't have to be that big of a deal. It can be just weirdly sitting in your closet. If you have children, which I might do because they can find you anywhere. If you are in the workplace, you can just take a walk. Just going outside improves productivity, productivity at workplaces, seeing the sun, vitamin D, just thinking about something that makes you happy, rewiring yourself before you go back into working. And the people who they kept doing the study, who kept working is I'm on a roll, I'm doing great, I'm getting through this. These workaholics, a lot of us are, were diminished and worn out and exhausted at the end of the day. And the mm -hmm. people who took those breaks every time felt energized. Imagine feeling energized at the end of the day when everything needs to happen. You know, whether you're with your children or you are with your friends or you're just think, you know, going to a play, you feel energized at the end of the day. And that's the secret to success. So, Contessa, a couple of times you've mentioned this idea of a boundary audit. So let's let's imagine that a woman has come to you and says, I'm about to pull my hair out. I'm so unhappy at work. I have no time for my family or myself. What, what do you do? What's that first step in that in doing that boundary audit? What's it actually look like? That first step is thinking about things. And the big one with women is guilt. And just sitting down and discussing when do you feel the most guilty at work? When do you feel the most resentful? And it, I had a client who said she felt very guilty when other coworkers would gossip. And then also when other coworkers would express negativity for the, for the workplace. And she said that it's, you know, it's what people do. And I'm like, yeah, people do that. But you, if you look around, not everyone is involved. So that could be a place where you're feeling guilty and resentful. You can, you can say, I need to have a boundary. And the next time we practice when, when they come to you with the gossip, what do you say? Practice that. I'm sorry. I don't want to participate in this conversation. That's a no, that doesn't have emotion attached to it. They can feel negative, but you're protecting yourself. And people can really influence how you feel if you're surrounded by it. They say you're only the best of the top five people you uh, hang out with the most. And that's true. And we hang out with our coworkers and clients more than anyone else. Taking your friends is important. <laughs> can, I, can I give you a suggestion? Not a suggestion, but I'll, I'll share. Yes, what you just said is really powerful. And um, one of the ways that I've done that, like I, I monitor my input heavily. I don't watch TV. I gave up on newspapers a long time ago. I, you know, because this is super important. And when it comes to those people, um, especially, you know, with what you were talking about before, when boundaries are a little different um, in the past and even recently, uh, you know, I've had some people in my life where when they show up, Sometimes I shudder just, you know, maybe you're on a phone call or whatever, and you just say, how are you? And I'm like, oh crap, it's going to be a three hour conversation <laughs> of nothing but, you know, bleh. And so um, I actually got to the point I got to where I, it used to be courage. And now it's just uh, honoring my boundary and my self-love and my self-care. When I've had, when I have those kind of people or those people show up, what I'll say to them is, hey, you know what? Um, I realize that you have a lot going on. Could you do me a favor? I would love to uh, stay connected to you, but I'd really love to hear some wins. Instead of all this, can you share with me, what are three amazing things that you've got going on? And it's that pattern interrupt. One of two things are gonna happen. They're gonna be like, what? Cause that, that's not, that's that's like, that's a non-threatening thing, right? I'm just telling them to shush up. I don't wanna hear the gossip, <laughs> but I'm not being snippy. I'm like, you know what? What, 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 what's a, what's a win that you can share with me instead? I'd love to hear from you, but what's a win? And it causes them, now they have to be responsible for their, their conversation, but I'm holding the boundary of what I want. I've done that with girlfriends who in the past have been miserable comforters. <laughs> it's like, I love you girl, but you know what? Rather than go here, can you tell me, if we're gonna start a conversation, share with me you know, top, a couple of wins and I'll share mine and then we can talk. I found the majority of time, if we get into that conversation of wins, we don't even have to deal with the negative. With clients, a lot of times that's one of those cleanup techniques. It's a really easy thing. So it's kind of fun. You get to celebrate, you get to celebrate too. Cause not every, I, I know me, I wouldn't always be in the past. I haven't been comfortable saying, hey, I don't want to hear gossip. <sighs> Although I do have a no drama policy. 
<laughs> yeah, and it, every and there's different techniques for different people. Like your strategy, if you do it enough times, it's reinforced. They see what's happening. They're not being allowed to cross your boundary. And um, I say, if you can do the no one, just practicing saying no is something that everyone I think could just oh, yeah. increase their skill in. Just they, you can go outside and just say no to someone who's offering you you know, and I like at the restaurant, a dessert, like just start off a little bit. And even at home, like, oh, I don't want to watch that TV show with you. And I don't want to go on Saturday. Just saying the word, just say no 10 times to yourself before you have a moment, get you in that mindset without maybe even having to say the word no. Like your mind is already there. Like, I'm not going to deal with this boundary crosser. I love her, but I'm not going to deal with boundary crossing. And then your friends get to feel happier. They you, you share, you know, strength and empowerment and positivity. And like I said before, your minds are so powerful. We can think what we feel and feel what we think. So why not use that like you did? Yeah. I think it's really interesting that gossip um, was mentioned as an example. And because in my, in my work and many women and, and men have, communicated just the challenge of it in the workplace toxic and so I just just created some videos just five minute video links on how to address gossip without getting sucked in and how important it is to be ready and just verbally um communicate but also there are ways to let them know the impact that it has and the danger for them so um interesting so um, I, that, I i put my um email in the chat box so if anyone wants those <laughs> links i'll be glad to share those and and when when you have a framework and when you're ready and as, as you said, kind of bring those tools when you practice, then, I mean, you can deal with all kinds of what I call verbal crimes. It could be complaining and get ourselves out and we empower ourselves to step up to those and influence change. And even if they don't change, we have changed and we've taken back our power and we're not the victim. So I love how you said we are able to have control over situations without controlling other people right like example and also being prepared being prepared is so important because a lot i know my thing is being unprepared for a conversation is when i am not at my best and so just doing that practice and acting like that if that's your, a value of yours it's a priority and mm -hmm. prioritize what's important to you and not someone else's priorities as you said before Lori. like people will tell you it's an emergency and it's not really, not to my boundaries today. <laughs> I wanted to know if uh, if Mo Monique or Suna or Leanne, if you guys have anything you'd like to add to the conversation or, or a question or a comment. Well, I, I will, uh, first I apologize for being late um, and I was just listening. Uh, my, my interactions, uh, um, because I'm a sole, I don't have anyone else in my company. I usually deal with other companies that, whether it's a production company for a runway show, models, a, a lot of subcontract. Um, so a lot of the conversation here is stuff that I do with my own daughters. And I think that practice makes perfect and smaller instances are better to practice before getting to the big problems. Mm -hmm. And the more you get, the more you teach your daughters to practice at a younger age when they get into an office situation or company situation it won't be so hard because you have to struggle with adrenaline like you get excited and you don't know how to keep those emotions down but if you practice and you teach your daughter you know talk about the things that are important that speak up and if it's not a problem then just let it go um a, a lot of the other discussions here that i've heard self-preservation self-care I think it's so embedded in our, my culture and in my, in my lifestyle at home, I see my daughters already doing it and they don't think about it. Um, mm -hmm. Tea time, uh, making a nice nutritional breakfast, um, taking a walk, um, meditating, stretching. I mean, there's mm -hmm. so many things you can do. Just taking deep breaths, um, you know, 
I mean, so anyway, so I'm just, most of it is just listening to you ladies. Um, I, as I don't have that interpersonal uh, conflicts in an office situation, because that's not my work. I'm a fashion designer and, and I'm traveling and, you know, London show fashion, New York fashion week and stuff. So I'm dealing with corporations and, and such, I'm, I'm such a, a, a alpha female alpha type a I, I don't have time for bullshit and if something doesn't go right or needs to be taken care of i have to speak up so it's again it's all about practice and um teaching our daughters at a younger age it has to be implemented like as as like eating and breathing and waking up just being a human being just because when you have a, a male or a son and you have daughters you you raise them differently we don't look at it but we do i mean i have a son my daughters tell me all the time that i i raised him different than my daughter so i have to check myself mm. constantly as a mother but it's anyway ingrained. that's my culture yeah it's ingrained as a civilization of how we um you know i work with teachers too and they talk about how they are very happy when the girls are so com complacent and the boys are all, all crazy and it's like we are reinforcing this in so many ways without even being conscious of it. So if you are empowered already, getting to the younger generation is key. If you see a young person or a girl, let them know not to just be assertive when it's a, a political big issue. Be assertive when you feel uncomfortable. And that will be very empowering to girls as they mature in a very sometimes scary world. And especially when they get to their careers. Men are making much more than women and they have this confidence factor that works very well for them. We tend to not say anything unless we are absolutely sure and correct. And it's been shown that men will say something and they look more confident and more uh, lead, like a leader. And so it's just starting everything like this at the youngest age is really empowering and empowering others because we are in this together. <laughs> Yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt. Um, so much of what you've said is just like, so important that we start recognizing what we see in our in younger people coming up, recognizing what we see in ourselves um, and, and giving ourselves approval and, and accolades for every time you recognized it and made a change. You know, I mean, that's, that's just as important as, you know, maybe you, you violated one of your own boundaries, but you went, oh, I recognize what I did there. I'm not going to do that again. You know, is that's progress. That's growth in the right direction. And another way to like support yourself is to see, are you creating structure in your life? If there's something that you cannot control, maybe your boss comes to your, I know a woman said her boss will come to her desk like every day for 30 minutes at different times and she will be in a flow and it would be really distracting to her, but it was her boss. So we talked about how creating structure and we suggested that she meet with her boss every day for 15 minutes at a certain time. And now the boss gets to say what they, they did. He didn't understand that there was a boundary there, mm -hmm. you know? And even if it's not even, like you said, you worked in the fashion industry, you might be have, have do a lot of traveling and with airlines and dealing with people and just telling them like, this is what's going to happen. Like if I'm on the plane, I need to have something to drink when I get on or I'm gonna feel famished. Like just any place that you were with that in your professional setting, sometimes you might not want to push back because you're around other um, business entities, but you can always assert yourself, you know, politely. But if you don't back down, no one can push your boundary. And you can also choose to leave, you know, leave what's happening at that moment, regroup, restructure, and think about how can I approach this again? But just giving up and letting it happen is not gonna help you. Yeah, yeah. Leanne, did you have a, a comment to make? I saw you at one point, it looked like you were leaning forward. I wanted to make sure we give you space. Um, <clears throat> sure, I'm just enjoying listening to all of you and absorbing everything. Um, but I was gonna just add one thing that um, I, I mostly do executive search, but I do executive coaching as well. And one of the things that I've seen a number, because I, I coach actually more men than women, interestingly enough, more men will come to me to get coaching to help them be more effective in their leadership than women will, which I have been surprised by. Um, <clears throat> I find women are much more cost conscious 
or uh, thinking they can they can do it themselves and they can do everything, right? Because we are super beings. <laughs> Um, but one of the things for the women that I am coaching that I do see them falling into is which builds on um, something that was said earlier is they re, we rework circumstances in their head over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And they just like, it gets bigger and bigger. So <laughs> it just grows. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so I'm dealing, working right now with this one leadership team and the CEO, who's a female, there was an incident that occurred once. And she has worked this and stressed herself out so much about this thing that now she's looking at just destroying the company. She's all of her behavior is very destructive. Um, it's very um, uh, self-preservation type behavior. Um, and it's to such an extreme that she's no longer communicating effectively. Um, <clears throat> she's having difficulty seeing that she's created her own reality based on this emotional reaction to a behavior that it was inappropriate, but it wasn't like, it wasn't really that bad. It was just somebody strongly disagreed with her um, and used a big man voice when he did so. <laughs> so, you know, um, it happens, right? <laughs> um, and it, I mean, now I'm just I, like, I'm just trying to talk her off her ledge right now. It's, it's really interesting. And she's not the first one I've worked with that's done this spiraling, you know, like, as you said, when you replay it in your brain, if you replay it based on those original flight or fright emotions, it, it's amazing to see how it accelerates and it just starts to permeate everything she looks at, everything this guy says. I mean, this poor guy, super, super nice guy. He can't win now. Mm -hmm. There's nothing he can say that she doesn't judge to be, um, you know, in, inappropriate. Uh, so it's, it's, it's an well, interesting think, thing. Well, we think can. about how she feels now. She lived a very excruciating moment, was triggered, probably connecting to something else that might have happened in her life. It was living it over and over, probably multiple times within a minute over and over. She's reliving that stressing her body out over and over. She I'm getting chill bumps. She's feeling that all the time because when we think something, our brain makes new neural pathway connections. So if you can help support her and asking her, when did a moment that was similar go very well for her? And then she can replay that positive moment whenever mm -hmm. she thinks about that negative and her brain will fill that happiness over and over and, and will grow her brain to think it's always happy and it should be, you know, but it's, it's, it's very upsetting to hear that people are, are feeling that way often. And it's this ruminating cycle and it's ingrained into us when we're very, very young. Think about what you just did. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, why? I mean, tell me what I've learned from this. Let's discuss a different outcome. But that's something I, I would definitely suggest with her. Mm -hmm. I'm sure she yeah. has many positive moments that are getting just diminished and will disappear. You know, you said he can't mm -hmm. win now. <laughs> well, he needs some <laughs> learning communication as well. Mm -hmm. Our mansplaining yeah. gentleman is, you know, <laughs> yeah, he's actually responding really well to the coaching. He's learned a whole new vocabulary. Oh. He's learned to to pause. Uh, I mean, he is my superstar. I'm so proud of him. But yet he still can't say anything right. <laughs> but I love how you said pause. That's another part of when people ask us things, we need to learn to pause more. Mm -hmm. And when I say pause, even taking a deep breath or saying, that sounds like it would work for me. Let me get back to you. Like I feel so uncomfortable just saying that right now because it's one of those things for many people that's very difficult, but pausing will really, really help before you give a choice back to someone else about what you're going to be doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I want to add something what you just said, Contessa, and also what Leanne, you, what you're telling your story. Um, Aside from playing a negative uh, scenario or the negative story, let's just say, another thing that um, I find women do and um, I find my daughters do, and by the way, my daughters are adult they're not <laughs> kids, they're adults, they, they work and they live on their own, is 
when their situation happens and they haven't solved it, they will actually create a storyline, A, B, C, like a movie, and these, these, and this, and it's like dramatic and it's just scandalous and it's just problematic. And I'm like, and then they'll tell me, and then, and I, because I know that I used to do this, I'm like, don't play out something that hasn't even happened because they'll stress on something that hasn't even happened. They've already planned it out and they saw the whole movie go on. And, and I'm like, take a step back, what actually happened? And, and stop uh, dramatizing all these outcomes. And, and what you said was really, it, it struck and reminded me that those are called creating stories. And our culture is so big on creating stories. And so I, I used to listen to this happiness podcast that was so fun by Dr. Puff. And he would talk about in any situation, you can actually be happy. Even if the worst of the worst, I wouldn't say what he would say happened. You can still think about what is in, in to make you happy. So if you, so if, let's say a story starts with uh, that situation happened at work. She can start thinking now, oh my gosh, like he told his friends, they're talking at lunch about me. I saw someone look strange to me yesterday. That's probably because they talked about it. I, I overheard this and you create all these stories about what's happening and your brain is living this and thinking this when nothing from your point of view has happened. And so we need to stop making stories, even for other people. Like if I say no, she's going to go home and she has all these kids. She's not going to be able to do it. And her father's going to be angry to not go to the re It's like, what? We, we are going from A to nothing because that has not happened. So we need to stop making stories for ourselves and you can make your own story, not for other people. You can ask and inquire, but you do not take upon, that's a bit of codependence, creating these stories and taking their emotions into you. And so I feel like I find, I, I love how you brought, brought that up. <laughs> yeah, we, the stories we tell ourselves are way worse than what's really going on most of the time. And about other people a lot. We're yeah. so worried about their stories and, and it, most of the time it's not gonna happen. Yeah. And so we don't, we don't wanna trick our brains into reliving something. Our thoughts are powerful. Our thoughts can be materialize anything that we want. Yeah. We need to focus on, I wanna materialize my value system to feel not resentful, guilty at work. I wanna feel like I have the time that I need to be at home when I'm at home. Mm -hmm. Well, Contessa, this has been such a great conversation, and and I thank all of you that have been on the line with us or on the on the line. Boy, I, I just went back to talk radio days, right? But it, who's been here with us online um, for your contributions and your questions? It's been a really, really rich conversation, and I thank you for that. So, before we wrap up, though, um, how do people work with you? What's your process, and how can they reach you? Yes, so you can reach me at Contessa at Contessaology. Um, I can put it in the chat as well or uh, www.contessaology.com. And so we usually start with an initial consult to see where you need support in your career life satisfaction journey. It could be with boundaries. It can be with creating opportunities for advancement. It can be just being happier with your career choice or maybe a career pivot. A lot of people want to do a career pivot, but we find out that we can actually help find you and make you happier in the role that you're in or a different role in your same company. So if anything like that is pertaining to what you need, um, and I do kind of lead into the life balance as well. So I, I definitely welcome people who are looking for solutions for that as well. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again for your time. Thank you, ladies, for joining us here. It was lovely to see all of you. And stay tuned for our next Ask Me Anything or in the Ladies Room segments as you see them advertised. Feel free to join us, share it with your, your friends. And this particular segment, we've been recording it. It'll be posted on the Connected Women of Influence website uh, probably by tomorrow. And you can feel free to go back and listen to it again and share it with your colleagues as well. So, all right. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your day and, uh, and be safe out there. Bye. Thanks, Thanks, Contessa. Bye, Patty. Thank you, Contessa. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.